Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's start the last session of um, Humans 2020, How Citizens Can Change Europe. Um, whilst in the previous sessions we focused on specific issues that we've seen how they are all tied together, though, um, this afternoon we will focus more on actually how change can happen and how citizens, movements, organizations can uh, um, find the best tools, approaches uh, and uh, methodologies for um, a movement, which is the goal ultimately of humans, um, able to, to produce the change that we want to see. Um, this afternoon is divided into two sessions. The first one is uh, uh, with some discussions and the second part is more for us to talk about how we see ideally and what we imagine as needed uh, a movement as a tool to achieve the political goals that we defined in these last days. Um, and they will go a bit together but let's start uh, from the transnational activism topic. Uh, there will be Marco Cappato, um, Monica Frassoni, who was the former chairman of the European Greens, and she's also together with Marco, the promoter of the European Citizen Initiative on Carbon Pricing. Uh, there is Christian Renou, um, who is the coordination, coordinator of our co coordination <laughs> pour l'éducation à la non-violence et la paix. Credo si dica così, I hope it says like that. Coordination for Education at Nonviolence and Peace. And uh, Maria Luisa Stasi from Article 19, who was already with us yesterday on the Europality session. And then we have Jesse Colzani from the Good Lobby. Thanks for being with us, even if you have an event in two hours or so. Um, so I think to, to start, uh, I would like to ask to Marco to, to kick this off and uh, uh, tell us a bit about how the, all your story of action and political action outside of the parliament um, became a sort of a methodology that can be applied to uh, European political movement. Okay, thank you, Virginia, and thanks to everybody. Well, I think there is not such a magic formula in order to... Um, to have success in involving citizens in obtaining uh, some uh, uh, important political goals. Um, sometimes it happens that a person alone, even without an organization, can mobilize much more than uh, uh, plenty of organization. Uh, I see here uh, Ottavio Mazzocchi, um, and the example come to my mind. I already did this example uh, many times. I'm sorry for those who already heard uh, about it. But uh, um, at the beginning of, uh, of, the, uh, of the 2000, 2001, 2002, I was a um, draft man for the European Parliament on the Directive on Privacy in the Electronic Communication. And at that time, we um, were working with uh, tens of groups in favor of digital rights around Europe. There was a long list uh, uh, of people. And um, of course, we were organizing conferences, uh, signing appeal. And uh, for example, there was uh, uh, an illegal transfer, transfer of personal data of, of, air, uh, of airline uh, passenger from uh, Europe to the United States. We also s organized a demonstration in the Zavenden airport. Do you remember? Very successful. Um, uh, protesting against this illegal transfer of personal data to the United States without the consent of the, of the passenger. Um, but at the end, nobody Give uh, how do you say no? Uh, no nobody. No. A dam, a dam, a dam, a dam. No, nobody really cared. Uh, and um, well, uh, and uh, Edward Snowden made uh, much more than hundreds of organizations, political parties, and so on, with <coughs> with this. Uh, lonely experience in a way 
to explain the world what was happening and is still happening uh, about uh, the abuse of personal data. So one man alone did perform much better than uh, a complex network of organization on this issue. We could also discuss about it because uh, is n it is not that true for the second problem, which is uh, not just to denounce a problem, but, but to create a political solution to a problem. And uh, for this, a man alone or a woman alone is not enough because Snowden succeeded very well in denouncing what is happening with personal data, but uh, no, without a mobilization, without organization, without uh, institutional goals, this uh, alarm that he launched uh, remained without political consequence at the end. Uh, of course, in these days, you could take the example of Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg uh, did alone with, his, uh, with her uh, panel more to sensibilize to global warming uh, more than uh, the, 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 the whole uh, environmental, uh, ecological, I mean, Monica Frazzoni is here, uh, like uh, movement. Uh, um, but then, again, the difficult part maybe is the following, is uh, which institutional proposal, political proposal, can then uh, be activated to solve the problem. Uh, so, um, Virginia asked about, about my experience. Uh, in like seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, uh, we decided in Italy with Associazione Luca Coscioni to, um, to go explicitly on the issue of the legalization of euthanasia we decided to start collecting signatures. In Italy, if you collect uh, 50,000 uh, signatures, you can uh, propose a law to the parliament. Um, and the parliament is not really obli obliged to do anything, so it's a very weak instrument, in a way similar to the European citizen initiative. And uh, we collected the signatures, but if we had limited to do that, I don't think we would have obtained any, any result. What we then did was to concretely help uh, patients who were contacting us in order to obtain euthanasia or uh, assisted, uh, medically assisted suicide. We decided to help them as a civil disobedience action and then uh, um, uh, trial were triggered, we went to the Constitutional Court, I will not uh, tell uh, uh, the whole story. So, um, but then we obtained the law on, uh, on um, uh, living will in Italy two years ago and uh, two months ago we obtained from the Constitutional Court the, a sort of de facto legalization of uh, medically assisted suicide in very specific, specific circumstances. So we, we, we made it. We obtained two important changes in the law thanks to the combination of the activation of a popular initiative and the activation of nonviolence. Um, and uh, even a mix of uh, the action of individuals, the patients, and also myself and Mina Buelpi, who denounced uh, ourselves uh, in order to provoke, to trigger the, uh, the, the, the legal initiatives, but also not only individuals, but also organizations. So to collect uh, um, 70,000 signatures so in order to make uh, uh, campaigns and so on, you need money, you need organization. So I think, uh, in a way, um, as I said at the beginning, there is not a magic formula, but you need uh, both. You need individuals and their stories, and maybe nonviolence action, and violent actions uh, on the on one side, but you need also 
an organization to do that in the long run, at least in the long run. And you need to focus on some specific political institutional goal, maybe using uh, the tools of popular initiatives, which is, uh, in a way, the mission with whom we, um, we decided to create uh, this uh, elements, this uh, network, um, exactly in order to reinforce the possibility of uh, making political proposal not just uh, in the framework of electoral campaigns, and we know how electoral campaigns, well, Lorenzo uh, explained very well before, how electoral campaigns are more and more manipulated and less and less credible uh, to, for voters, but to activate it and, and to reinforce uh, this uh, second uh, branch of democracy, which is uh, participatory democracy, uh, which is uh, a fundamental one if you want uh, to raise proposals that are not already in the political official agenda. Uh, because the political official agenda is uh, weakened, by, weakened by the fact of being mainly a national agenda and a partisan as agenda. And uh, what, we, uh, what we need is uh, also to have non-partisan goals, so goals that can, can be um, supported by people from many different uh, political affiliation and sometimes uh, on goals that are going beyond national border. And what, uh, this is exactly what is uh, uh, basically missing uh, in the political landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, I will uh, skip on the other side of the spectrum uh, with Jesse Colzani. I would like to... This Colzani? Colzani. Um, so the good lobby helps citizens to get the power to a certain extent uh, through a number of, uh, of tools that are available. And in general, your mission is to help individual citizens to take part in, in the changing pro policy making process. So can you tell us a bit how this works, uh, how the good lobby had the idea to, to do this and which are the main major part of unknown tools that are available for citizens to, to do this? Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, first of all, Virginia, uh, Marco, and everybody for inviting me here today. Um, and it's also great how uh, Marco already introduced uh, a little bit of the concept uh, um, that there is behind uh, the Good Lobby. Um, so my name is Jesse Gozzani. I'm pro bono manager at the Good Lobby. Uh, I've been in the organization for almost two years now. Um, so what what is the Good Lobby? The Good Lobby, first of all, is... Uh, a simple but potentially really powerful idea. Um, and it's the idea that any citizen can lobby in the same way corporations do. Uh, there is a lot of uh, mystification of the concept of lobbying uh, here in Brussels and as well in other parts of uh, Europe and the world um, behind the idea of lobbying. Um, but for us, it's mainly just a tool. It's not good, it's bad, it's just a tool. Um, so the, the idea of the good lobby started about five years ago. It started in the same way humans uh, uh, started uh, this year. Uh, a bunch of volunteers, uh, and we quickly evolved, uh, and now we, we have an established office and stuff. Um, so yeah, there is this, this feeling of powerlessness uh, and inequality that we are trying to address. And uh, the, all the protests and the movements that we see, uh, the last uh, the, the sardines in Italy, uh, are a symptom of citizens not having uh, a voice in the policy making uh, process. So our solution is providing the tools and the expertise uh, to the citizens in order to enable them to, to have a, a voice uh, and have a seat at the table. We do this in uh, two main ways. The first one is uh, skill sharing, the concept of skill sharing, which in the legal sector is known as uh, pro bono. Um, so there is expertise uh, 
that can help citizens in either drafting amendments, uh, going before court, uh, uh, and so on. So rather than just pouring money into civil society and uh, expecting them to manage it uh, correctly and so on, uh, we directly provide, provide the expertise. Uh, and the second part of the good lobby is more about providing the tools. Uh, so as uh, uh, Virginia was saying, there are a number of uh, uh, already existing channels of participation. Uh, and the, the big challenge is uh, letting citizens know that these channels exist uh, and teaching them how to, how to use them. Um, because at the end of the day, between the elections, the citizens uh, feel like the only two ways they can engage in policy making is by voting or by running for office. Uh, but there is so much more they can do in the meantime. So we developed uh, this thing that is called, we call Citizen Lobbyist Toolkit. Um, you can find it also online or on our website. And there are a number of, uh, of, um, of tools that citizens can use to leverage um, on decision makers. Uh, I'm just going to make some examples. Uh, uh, probably some of them have already been covered, uh, so, uh, for instance, the ECI. Uh, but f by requesting documents uh, and information, this is the first one, so freedom of information requests. Uh, uh, this is a big thing in, in, in Europe. It's very used by the, the private sector, uh, and we, we teach citizens how to use that. It can be very strategic as a, um, as a tool and especially if used uh, in combination with uh, another tool which is the complaints uh, to the Ombudsman. In, Euro in Europe we have the European Ombudsman, but also there are on a national level and in Italy, for instance, on a regional level. Uh, so if you do not get information, documents, uh, you go to the Ombudsman and you can have uh, a quite good impact uh, and uh, pressure decision makers. Uh, of course, we have it covered the ECI and the popular legislative initiative. Uh, in some countries, it requires a number of signatures, uh, uh, such as in Italy, as Marco was saying. At the European level, is still at its infancy uh, because one million signatures are uh, quite a lot, uh, but it's slowly improving. Uh, always on the European level, we have uh, petitions uh, to the European Parliament. Uh, we have public consultations. Uh, uh, these are all tools that are accessible to citizens, uh, um, and it's all about explaining how to use it uh, and uh, use them in a very strategic way, of course, uh, with some experts that support you. If you have a lawyer or a EU professor that can help you drafting uh, one of these uh, requests, uh, it, it can be much more uh, effective. And then we also have some, some other instruments, such as the refit. Uh, it's not very well known, but it's an instrument uh, of the European Commission to make uh, um, legislation more simple. Uh, it's very used by the industry, not very used by uh, civil society. And then, of course, we have the more informal petitions that you can also use on online platforms. Uh, and uh, the last one I wanted to mention, which is not usually considered as a, a lobbying or advocacy tool, but it's uh, litigation. Uh, so we really value strategic litigation, and it can be one of the most powerful tools. Uh, uh, going back to, to what Marco was saying, he mentioned one citizen making the difference, uh, Edward Snowden. We have this other example as well. It's a, a guy called Max Schrems. He was uh, a law student, uh, uh, an Austrian law student that was studying uh, in California. And at some point, he sued Facebook uh, by asking all the, the information. And somehow, he also triggered the process that led to the, the GDPR that we all know today. Just one guy, one law student. So you can make the difference even as a, a single citizen. Um, so I, I don't have too much time. I won't get too much in depth. Uh, yeah, of course, we have uh, uh, our The Good Lobby Awards uh, that are going to be in uh, roughly two hours from now, always in this building. You just have to cross uh, on the other side of the street. Uh, it would be great to have all, all of you guys uh, there. And I'm also leaving uh, some of our reports uh, there on the table. And uh, <laughs> very important, some uh, forms, uh, because we, are, we have this action that is ongoing uh, to ask the European Parliament to begin an investigation uh, for the failure of EPP and ACRE to comply with the European fundamental values, specifically for the episodes, uh, for what's going on. Sorry? 
for what's going on uh, in uh, uh, Poland and the Hungary, violation of rule of law. So any of you that wants to sign the forms, uh, uh, give it to Virginia or maybe bring it later at the awards. Uh, uh, I'm just going to leave them there. So thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Jesse. Um, so you mentioned strategic litigation, and this is a quite good uh, um, move to our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Maria Luisa Stasi. Sa Ma Maria Luisa Stasi. Uh, so we know her because she she spoke yesterday about uh, with great details about digital rights. Uh, but I think Article 19 is quite an interesting case of an organization, uh, and she's a lawyer, so she's going to tell us something about how strategic litigation works, how it can work, and why it's a good move. Yeah, it works. Well, thank you again. Uh, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here today as well, to be exposed to all these ideas. And um, I have to say uh, that what, what I'm going to say is going to be part uh, my personal beliefs and part uh, what I've learned in these couple of years uh, within uh, my organization. Um, so uh, just to give you the context, uh, at Article 19 we do uh, three main activities. Uh, one is policy development, the other one is advocacy, and the third one is strategic litigation. Now, strategic litigation is a very um, niche activity, uh, but uh, for, for a couple of reasons I will, will explain afterwards, we see it's very complementary to uh, the advocacy we do. Um, what I want to say on a personal belief is that I'm strongly, comp uh, whatever I'm going to say, many of the things that I was planning to say, they will complement what has been already said, which I think is good because it shows that we are kind of all in the same boat. Um, so I am strongly convinced that uh, individuals can make a difference, that we don't really need uh, huge masses, although in, in, in some circumstances is uh, more effective and in general in terms of legitimacy, uh, for fights and changes. Uh, this is the ideal situation. Uh, but I do, I am strongly convinced that individuals can make a difference and that this is possible uh, mapping out a number of tools that you have and try to move among these tools in the best way possible. Um, so um, strategic litigation is one of those tools. Uh, what I think it's extremely important uh, is that strategic litigation, usually you intervene in court cases or you can create the casus belli. So now, what is important from an activist per perspective, but from a lawyer perspective as well, uh, what I've learned is that uh, the more the individual case reflects collecti the collective dimension, the better this is gonna be for the future. Uh, so the idea um, is to try to make the individual case as representative as possible for the community needs, the community um, desires, the community wishes. How can we make this link? As a lawyer, we're usually the third party, so we step in afterwards, or even at the beginning, but we're not the individual concerned and we're not the community concerned. So what is very, very important is to stop at the very beginning and listen to them. And notwithstanding the fact that we step in with the proper tools, with the, the skills able to argue a case in court, present it in the proper way, shape it in, depending on the kind of rules and laws that we wanna, uh, we wanna trigger, uh, it's important that we, as, as lawyers, that we don't modify uh, the message that the individual and the community wants to bring forward. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes, depending on the case, um, that there is uh, there is not sufficient alignment. But I think this is fundamental to trigger the change. So what I would um, uh, say uh, from as a, again from a lawyer perspective is that the the legal language need to represent. Uh, the message and not to reshape it because this will damage the, the community or the individual that is that is looking forward for the change. Uh, we are messengers and we need to do that uh, in the best way possible. So um, it, it's it's important that then the people you fight for they recognize in the message. And uh, this uh, a good way to do this is to try to establish a dialogue to see this from from the individual and the collective perspective, and also to accompany that with uh, other instruments like raising the awareness, trying to involve the community. The second main point, uh, well, for me there will be many, but the second one is that 
strategic litigation can you can create the case or you you step in in a case and um, if you do a good job and you get the, the judgment you want and the change you want uh, you get that in paper then there is the enforcement which is a completely different chapter and it's a chapter where um, Combining different instruments will be the most the most uh, uh, recommended uh, way. So, if you get a, a judgment that uh, recognizes your rights, and that this judgment most probably will need uh, a change, in, will will uh, provoke a change in the system. You need to be able to monitor this change and to push this change for happen to happen. Otherwise, uh, it's kind of a half victory, and it's not going to be uh, reflected in the the improvements in society that you want to see. So, um, as uh, when we do when we do intervene in cases and we get a favorable judgment, what we do immediately after we lobby the government, the or the parliament, and we ask for the change that we need. And there we try to be as propositive as possible, and again as representative as possible. So we try to make the individual case as collective uh, as possible. We try to think about the impacts that the remedies we're suggesting will have not only on the individual but on the community. Uh, because this, there can be many, many trade-offs. There can be many, many issues where the individual um, best, best case will create damages for the community. So you need to reason about this with the people involved and think about a systemic change, not only on the specific change. Um, all this seems pretty obvious, but sometimes it happens quite fast and it's not necessarily in the picture because if you focus on the specific element, then you, you might lose the, the big picture. Um, so what I've learned as well in these uh, years of experience is that you need to kind of have the, the, the two points of reference always in mind and try to combine them as much as possible. Uh, another point that was raised was about uh, non-partisan and cross-border. Uh, uh, fights or uh, struggles often uh, I am um, I am an activist for free speech so I don't think this is a partisan issue uh, so uh, the majority of fights that we raise are non-partisan unless uh, of course but this is this depends on the context uh, we attack um, a specific rule that is supported by the majority in a parliament uh, and in a government, so that we, we go against the, uh, the government. But this is a, an indirect uh, effect. Um, so no, again, nonpartisan, I think, has the privilege that you can uh, you can represent a community that is across the parties, uh, which might make your fight a little bit more. Um, uh, easy in, in for, for citizens, for a population to identify, and also the enforcement afterwards will, be, will, ha will have uh, a broader impact, let's say. Uh, for cross-border, I think European Union is one of the best places to try to organize this. Um, I am, uh, my organization is international in scope, but we, uh, in Europe, we cooperate with a number of umbrella organizations, and they exist just for putting together people from different uh, uh, member states on common fights. So I think I haven't seen in any other place uh, the framework already there, uh, the instruments already, uh, the network already there for common fights. So cross-border fights in Europe are, you know, they're always diff difficult, but Europe is one of the easiest places for this to happen. So I would strongly encourage to do that every time. It's good that it's easy, so we feel a bit less the pressure <laughs> of the mission. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Maria Luisa. Um, I would like to now to ask millions of questions to Monica Frassoni, <laughs> no, but uh, I will stick on a couple of questions. Uh, you were the um, um, chairman of the European Greens for 10 years, uh, and I think the European Greens are a particular kind of a beast because uh, it's one of the first uh, uh, party that built up as a federation in Europe as a federation of parties. On the other side, we talked quite a lot about not partisan politics and uh, um, not what is, and participatory democracy. So my question to you is, first of all, which are the opportunities and the limits of party politics within the European Union? But also why, for example, uh, you are the promoter of the European Citizen Initiative on Carbon Pricing, so why you felt that there was a need for a citizen mobilization uh, for a policy that potentially could also happen as a um, 
traditional party type of approach. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Stop the chat. Okay, so first of all, let me say, uh, Virginia, that I was the co-president, uh, the co-president, um, and chairman is Marco. I am a co, I am a chairwoman. Uh, these kind of things, uh, I know it sounds pedantic, but uh, it's, uh, it's somehow important to uh, uh, to to underline. Um, Voila, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. Uh, I believe that um, to answer your question, I can, uh, I can, uh, I can say two things. First, um, on the transnational action, the transnational activity, um, the, the idea is that the European Green Party, which was uh, created in 2004 from a federation of national parties, always thought that in order to implement green policies, you have to work at local, national, but at European level. You absolutely need a supranational framework where you uh, are able to act. And this supranational framework must not be symbolic, but must hold real power. And I think that that is the first um, thing I want to say in terms of uh, answering your question, in the sense that uh, the mobilization around more European democracy, more European participation, and the capacity of having an area where democratic power is ex 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 exercised is very much linked to the um, capacity of implementing what we stand for, which is uh, basically the social uh, transformation through uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, what is now became very fashionable, but we started to talk about it 10 years ago, the, the so-called Green New Deal, or uh, um, in general, the, the, the sustainability challenge. So it is somehow um, th this uh, transnational part is something that uh, that is very much into the the courts of of the greens. On the other hand, I think that uh, the uh, fact that in general, not always, but in general, the greens are uh, are very much active on an idea of. Um, party of, uh, of power that comes from the fact that people are active and, and achieve goals um, made a lot of people think that, the, well, in reality, Greens are not a party, but are a movement. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, there is, there are NGOs who are working at the level of, uh, of civil society, etc. But the party is something that is striving to enter institution and to be in government. So, and I think that to create a, a too much of an artificial distinction between those two areas is one of the elements that at the end of the day are weakening both the good lobbies, as uh, somebody was saying earlier, uh, and the civil society, but also the political parties. Because basically, we, uh, this is, for example, the case very much in Italy, very much in Italy, in which uh, in, in the, in the situation is that, for example, now the so-called Sardine movement, or even the Five Stars movement before, um, in some cases also the climate, the Friday for Future, which now is also stuck because of that somehow, um, they say, no, 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 we don't want to have any kind of partisan uh, uh, in, uh, involvement, which is crazy. In reality, what they should ask is to have as many uh, party politics uh, or party uh, politics uh, flags as possible with them in the square and not uh, you know, rejecting the idea that there must be some kind of, of political, uh, political involvement. So uh, this just to, to, to make a sort of premise of, uh, of, of, my, of, my, of how I will try to answer your question. I think that one of the successes of the Greens has been to be always very, very respectful of the autonomy of civil society, but also um, very much uh, of the idea that there is a role to be played in institutions and through a political party by uh, having basically the same um, contents of what the, social, the, the civil society wants. And being, in some cases, credible 
about being able to implement it. Just to go back to the climate uh, Friday for Future discussion, um, in Belgium, about 80% of the people who are in age to vote and go to the march vote for Ecolo or Grün. The same thing happens for, uh, uh, for, uh, for the Germans, and the same thing happens for the French. And there is not so much this mania about being out of, of the party politics discussion. I don't know if you heard about this uh, French um, initiative called L'Affaire du Siècle. You know, L'Affaire du Siècle is a, 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 a campaign that uh, was born a few, uh, a couple of years ago, but needed years of preparation because it's not at all improvised. We, we're trying to work on it in Italy. It's really complicated because it depends from time, from, from, from the legal, or the legal uh, realities of, uh, of, uh, of country to country. But, uh, you know, in the moment in which the Gilets Jaunes launched their petition, uh, L'Affaire du siècle uh, launched its own about the possibility of bringing um, the French government to court because of its inaction on climate. Uh, and they were able to collect two million of signatures in a very, very short amount of time because they could rely on a lot of uh, um, um, YouTuber, influencer, uh, but also normal people and party politics. The number two person that was on the list of the French Greens and who is now a member of parliament was the woman who invented l'affaire du siècle and who was doing both without any kind of difficulty. So I believe that uh, this issue of mixing, let's say, politics and, uh, um, and civil society activity, as far and as long there is a clear transparency or who does what, but also what are the goals and, uh, and what are also the, 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 the method, you know, the, the, the gentlemen or gentlewomen agreement that has to be, that have to be uh, uh, agreed uh, is really no problem. On the contrary, for things that are so difficult, like what we are striving for, that do not have billions of people, billions of, mon of, of euros like the gas industry or the coal industry, is absolutely indispensable. Because otherwise, I don't think that we'll, this thing will, uh, will, will actually uh, proceed. One very short comment on the question of the carbon uh, um, on the carbon uh, uh, pricing, um, even if this may seem a bit contradictory, uh, in reality the European Greens uh, decided to support the ECI as an instrument, but uh, uh, it was very difficult for me to get them to say, okay, let's uh, work directly on it because it is considered to be a citizen's initiative in which political parties as such should certainly support give space, give visibility, but uh, not, if you want, intervene in, first, in, in the first place. So it is, um, uh, it, is a, it, it is a sign, if you want, of, of respect, which as far as we are concerned is, uh, is, is a problem because we would like to have very much the, the very big push of the, uh, of the Greens on this one. But uh, uh, it also um, um, goes back to, uh, to a certain kind of coherence in which, okay, we can support but we are not go going to, to get a sort of political profit uh, from, uh, from, uh, from it. And uh, this is what we are trying to understand how and if they, the Greens can help us a bit more in the collection of signatures among their own members. particularly for the initial remark. I remark that this is the only panel with 50-50% speakers, male and female, so. <laughs> no, but thanks, it's very important. Um, thank you also for differentiating, I mean, to analyzing a bit the, um, the concept of politics, party politics, not party politics, because I think for what we do is quite important to uh, elaborate on this. Um, so the, the last discussant before opening up the conversation is Christian Renou. Uh, as I said, he coordinates a network of organizations that uh, are focused on education and practice of non-violence. And I'm very happy that he, he, he is here with us for two reasons. The first one is because non-violence is a term that we 
kind of bond us together for the major part of us who started to work on the humans project uh, but also because I met him thanks to a human activ humans activist who is Elena Passerini and we were having a conversation while collecting signatures at the events of the Greens and like uh, you do the campaigning for the initiative, you talk with other activists and people have connections and things sparkle through these type of things and I think it's precious that uh, he could come from Paris to this thanks to the connection that we were able to elaborate while doing our political activities. So double welcome to Christian Renaud. <coughs> Sorry, it's always my fault. <laughs> it's okay. Thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, Hello to everybody, bonjour, buongiorno, buonasera a tutti e tutte. Um, I receive um, a demand about uh, speaking about non-violence. Uh, it's a huge, huge area. We can speak about that for many, many hours. So uh, I'm also teaching history of non-violence, so my, my reflective to to tell some story about non-violence. Maybe, maybe I will more sh uh, share with you the experience we have in France, in Paris, about the uh, coalition for uh, education for peace and non-violence at school, only to, to show some experience, because I think if we are more here uh, in sharing experience of uh, different l advocacy and so on. So uh, we start in France to discuss about this uh, idea of a coalition inside the, the frame of the international UN decade about uh, culture of peace and non-violence, who was uh, voted in the UN Assembly, General Assembly in 1998. This vote itself was the result of the action of an individual who have made a, a difference in that. It was Pierre Marchand who was a representative of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, which is a whole non-violent movement. He was uh, the representative of the movement in UNESCO. And he discovered that there is a discussion uh, around culture of peace in UNESCO. But he said, maybe it could be interesting to add also non-violence, which is not the idea at that time in UNESCO. And he, he had the idea to ask for a decade for the promotion of the culture of non-violence. And he succeeded to get this resolution voted in the General Assembly in 18 months with the support of some states, a lot of, he, he start with the support of the Nobel Peace Prize laureates, who was close to non-violent movement, and in a, he have a petition and so on, and he succeed to get, to, to get this resolution voted in 1998. From that, we decided in France to create a coalition to ask uh, the French government to set up an education for the children at school about non-violence and peace, which is not in the curriculum for the moment in any country, in fact, even if there is some initiative sometimes. And uh, what we, we decided to, to do it first to to set up a coalition of organizations who wanted to support the ideas, and uh, f for some time we were 90 organizations together. Uh, we made an advocacy to the government and made also to the parliament and uh, with a petition signed by 1,000 people. And also we worked on uh, an about-on level with uh, our organization who were already working for creating curriculum uh, action in schools. So there is already, like in a, a lot of European countries, organizations who are going in school and training children and teachers on these different uh, items of the culture of peace and non-violence, which is, in general, it's uh, uh, peer mediations or uh, education on conflict resolution or about uh, non-violence communication or feelings, uh, dealing and so on. So we, we set up this coalition and we, we have done this uh, advocacy work and we have been supported very strongly by the Green Party senators uh, in France and the Green Party at that time was in, a, in the governmental coalition and they make pressure on the government to put in the new law about education uh, something about uh, training for teachers on non-violence. And it had been included in the law with a very difficult uh, fight from the, <laughs> the Green because the French government was very reluctant to that because non-violence, you know, it's a Nobody knows what is it, you know, and uh, and there is also a way, always there is a 
difficulties with the army and the government are always linked to the army about uh, about that uh, item. They don't want to to have a non-violent escort. But the, the the Green Party have succeeded in that in 2013, and the uh, the non-violent conflict resolution trainings have been included in the 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 uh, how would you say that the mission of the uh, school the teacher training schools so now this is we just succeed last year to um, in in 2018 they have changed the curriculum and the references for teaching teacher training and now it's also included in the curriculum itself for the teachers, they have to learn about uh, co conflict resolution, which is a very new thing in France. You have that only in Sweden for the moment and in Europe. And uh, we are, in, as organization, we are still uh, working about uh, uh, promoting this uh, training for teachers and we have created a, a, a training hub to help the different uh, teachers to be uh, trained on that. So we have uh, written a, a, a French curriculum and after we had a Erasmus project to create a European uh, curriculum also with different partners and uh, we succeed to share our good practices on that and to set up this European curriculum. The main basis is always the same. It's about working on feelings with children, uh, about non-violence communication, about non-violence conflict transformation, authority and powers. And um, we will uh, implement this new uh, curriculum in a French part, which is uh, unexpected for us. It will be in Tahiti in uh, Polynesia. So the government of Polynesia asked us to come to to help them to set up a general training program for the society in Polynesia on culture of peace and non-violence. So we are very happy to have the, this opportunity to, to work with them. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I hope I didn't miss any one of the discussions, I think uh, we covered a few aspects, so I would like to open up the space for everyone to ask questions to to uh, the people that spoke before, or even adding some um, uh, ideas, suggestions, or experiences that can uh, help us to to enrich the um, the thinking around how uh, we should act at a, at, at a transnational level. Uh, so it's open. And, and of course, we have also Nicolò Milanese with us. And uh, since European Alternatives is quite a, um, one of the few organizations that tried to implement uh, um, European actions, maybe if Nicola wants to, to, to add something uh, based on your experience with European Alternatives can also be valuable if you want. Um, OK. Well, I think that our experience is that um, is that more and more people are talking about acting across borders uh, and the importance of campaigning and, and doing civic activism across borders. It's noticeable in the in the decade that European Alternatives has been acting. Uh, you know, when we started in two thousand and seven, more than a decade ago, we used to say to people, "We're called European Alternatives," and people said, "What does that mean?" Now we say we're called the European Alternatives and say, yes, that's exactly what we need. Uh, so there's a growth in awareness of the need for this kind of action, also amongst the wider citizenry. Um, but I would say that while we're very good at talking about it, uh, there's possibly even a loss of capacity in how to do it. If we compare with the generations prior to 89, for example, let alone the, the generations prior to that, the resistance and so on, our actual practical capacity to coordinate across borders to even understand each other. And I think it doesn't necessarily help that everybody thinks they're speaking the same English. So we think we understand each other, but actually uh, the things are much deeper than this. So there's a whole work of understanding the political reality in different parts of Europe and then concretely working together. This capacity, I would say, is still quite weak. Um, and so this is an important 
uh, element for us all to reflect on is how do we transfer the skills through generations about acting over borders and how do we uh, work on increasing the capacity of a wider group than the kind of people who would be here, given that many more of them than in the past see the need for this kind of transnational um, activism. So I think to throw it, I mean, already the education dimension came out of, of, of our discussions here, but I think that's a really important uh, dimension because I fear to say, I mean, I've, I've been looking at the UK situation all, all morning, I warned you about that, but I fear to say it's going to be a pretty hard fight for several decades to come, not only in the UK, but in other places in, in Europe. So it's about understanding how do we create new generations of uh, Europeans who can advance, defend and advance democracy across Europe. So education dimension is very important. Um, to me, I think that this, um, the elements that uh, Monica was talking about, about the uh, question of when to be involved in, about the, the fact that many social mu movements have been uh, rejecting formal politics and institutionalized politics um, over the past years is, is somehow ambiguous because it's true that in, in some movements in some parts of Europe, um, this is still very strong. You can't go to certain meetings if you're a member of a political party, and you certainly can't go if you're a member of parliament in some, in some places. Uh, in other places, the reflection has really moved on about, about, about this, and people have realized uh, that you know, we're not going to get anywhere if we, if we stay outside of the institutions. And so, of course, there's been experiences with creating new kinds of parties to enter institu into institutions, new kind of partnerships, new kinds of platforms. I think this... Um, Kind of kind of learning um, needs to be needs to be shared across Europe more urgently. The different um, the different uh, the the, diff the different reasons that different movements have moved in different directions. The, the, the third thing I want to throw into the discussion because I feel like it hasn't been talked about at least much today, and I wasn't here yesterday, is the uh, shall we say the social the social dimension of all of these questions. Um, that it's going to be really hard to persuade people about the importance of uh, the rule of law and, and combating climate change if we can't have a good answer to them when it comes to meeting their material needs at the end of every month. I mean, that's, everybody's been talking about that since the, since the Gilets Jaunes. But it's, and so I think that as part of a holistic approach to civic engagement uh, in Europe, there also needs to be a strong message about how um, this civic engagement is going to address your social concerns and social inequalities. It's something that, you know, in the minds of the European population, the European Union is not there to look after your, your social well-being, unfortunately. Um, and it's a great difficulty for us going out and saying, you should engage in European processes um, if we can't prove that as part of that you're going to get social justice. And so I think we need to have a reflection about social justice as a crucial element of European civic engagement. Those would be my three um, additions to what's been discussed. Grazie Nicolò. Intanto sono tornati gli interpreti. Well, the interpreters have come back. We're grateful to them. So there's now the possibility also to speak in other languages. Virginia. Kings at the same time. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, I'd say, okay, Sibilla. Um, in Italiano. <clears throat> Yeah, I wanted to say a few things. Uh, following these very interesting two days, I wonder what the prospects are now. Uh, there is, we could have a sort of virtual uh, round table involving all the associations who want to collect uh, this uh, bottom-up uh, feedback and uh, direct democracy and the limits and the prospects for direct democracy. Uh, I, I wonder how we could structure uh, this, uh, our work on, uh, our work together on uh, direct democracy. And um, I wonder what uh, categories of people or organizations we should be addressing. 
Um, I was thinking about students. Um, I think there might be some initiatives addressed to students. I think students are, are very, could be very receptive to our ideas about uh, direct democracy as a, an assistance to parliamentary democracy. Uh, and um, you know, what, if we could have a timetable for, for working on this, because the instruments we have are quite weak. And we, we need to think how we can strengthen them, how we can help them. And I also wonder if there are any you know, common objectives we could all agree on and put on, on the table. For example, we've heard Marco talked about uh, the importance of information and the fact that we um, are spending money which is... Um, which is money well spent if, it's, if it informs uh, citizens correctly about the possibilities they have of, inf of voting. Hervé. <laughs> Maybe introduce... I will speak in French, if you don't mind. I'm Hervé Parmentier. I'm one of the directors of the Secular Action Sector, which is a Belgian uh, French speaking association. And um, we, we were part of the. You know, we, 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 we had the idea, the initiative of. Or, or we were part of the people who organized this two day meeting. And we're trying to promote secularism as a fundamental. A pr principle of democracy to guarantee fundamental rights and freedoms. There are a number of issues we work on. We, we, we have a humanist perspective uh, on um, secularism, but also on issues of solidarity, liberty, equality. So, you know, the, 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 the things we're fighting for are, are similar to what we've been talking about, fundamental freedoms, the rule of law. This is an, a, 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 a fight we fight every day in the French-speaking part of Belgium. So I think that the work we do at European level has to be based on the work being done by national organizations like us, because we are the ones who are on the ground, who are in contact with the everyday difficulties and, and ambitions of people. So you, you have to keep in touch with the, what is happening on the ground. But of course, the, the national work being done on the ground has to be accompanied by international work. And um, we're part, that's why we're part of the European Humanist Federation. There are about 60 organizations uh, in this uh, federation. In Italy, we have the Coccione organization, a number of other organizations, all fighting for the same thing. So I'd like to, uh, yeah, I'd like you to be aware that uh, we we have a number of proposals on our program, uh, which we. We produce them in the run-up to the European election, and uh, we propose them to a number of European political parties, and we try to get political parties to support our agenda, our, our proposals. And um, the first thing we're concerned about is improving democracy, preserving the rule of law, and defending human rights. These are really are democratic fundamentals, the sort of thing we've been talking about for the last two days, reforming our Article 7 mechanism, so you have a preventive part, uh, so that you have a constant me monitoring to avoid the, 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 the ultimate sanction of Article 7 and all the difficulties we're having with that. Also, the reform of the European Citizens Initiative, the financing of civil society and its ability to act at European level. And that means giving uh, civil society organizations access to a number of European tools. You mustn't underestimate the bureaucracy uh, in which these European programs are, are swathed. It's very um, uh, very disheartening for uh, small organizations in contact with people on the ground, so we try and get them to overcome those, uh, the, that bureaucracy. 
Because from a secularist, humanist point of view, those fundamental combats are a precondition for the, all the other combats. So if you can get, uh, if you can defend democracy uh, and, the, and the rule of law successfully, then only then do you have a chance to promote equality and to promote more solidarity. So first things first, you have to fight for those basics first. And uh, we, I, we've been talking uh, over the last two days about um, democracy 2.0, you know, how do we uh, improve the way our democracies are functioning uh, so that there is a kind of e parity of esteem between representative democracy and participative democracy. Those should be seen as being uh, of, of, of equal uh, 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 dignity. And I think, as I understand, we're going to uh, address some proposals to Mrs. Eurova, and I think that has to be the starting point of our joint struggle. We need to have some common uh, objectives, some common proposals, and we've heard um, presentations on a lot of separate issues, which are all each legitimate in their own own right, but taken together, it's all rather, it becomes a rather complicated jumble, and you have it's, then it's difficult to motivate uh, citizens. Um, we need uh, each European citizens' initiative needs a million signatures, so that's why we need to. Uh, if, if you have everybody, if you have too many initiatives, it's difficult to get citizens interested in in all these initiatives, and and, and, and they're trying to work out which is the, the most useful. So first of all, we need to fight to get our democracy functioning properly, and only then can we concentrate on these sectoral issues, but which don't mobilize people as strongly as the more general issues. But the network of organizations we have get, helps us to get to know what, the, what each of us is doing, and that is important because it, we need to organize the citizens' initiatives. We need to know what's going on so that we can, we can mobilize around each other's initiatives. So I have some doubts about our ability to, <coughs> to construct joint proposals uh, in, in, independently of the demo, democratic tools. We, we, we've quoted a number of initiatives, but I don't know whether the, the ones we've chosen are the most motivating uh, and will enable us to uh, mobilize a maximum number of citizens through new, these new participatory democracy tools. So it's a, it's a strategic discussion we still need to have. Which of the subjects are the most promising? And I return to what was said at the beginning. We need, you need to keep in touch with the national situation, the situation on the ground, uh, because citizens are interested primarily in what is happening in their own country. And then on that basis, you try and build solidarity with other European citizens. I think a good initiative is women's situation, because women are, are in a similar situation in all European countries. They're being attacked by the same conservative things thinking by the same traditionalist approaches. So it's the same strategy everywhere in Europe, attacking women's rights. Uh, so everybody is in the same boat. Uh, we're, we're all confronted in the same uh, we, we, that's why we have campaigns promoted by um, supranational organizations to, uh, to uh, promote uh, uh, issues on abortion, uh, uh, fertility rates. We're, we're, so that's why we need to bring together women transnationally. With, uh, and, but it's not the same on other issues. Uh, in some countries, uh, one, a government is attacking a particular right. Another government is also attacking rights, but it's attack, it chooses to attack a different right. But where there is a transnational strategy to weaken the same set of rights, like, like women's rights, that's where we have a common enemy, that's where the, and the enemy is organized transnationally. I think that helped. It would be more useful us to try and motivate our, ourselves transnationally on that. That's the kind of exercise I'm talking about, looking for the subjects which are the most promising in terms of motivating a large number of European citizens.
Nous avons, euh, pendant la campagne électorale, je parle des Verts. Euh, Talking for the Greens, le... during the electoral campaign, we launched a, a tool which was called Tilt. And we did several campaigns on the basis of petitions and um, collections of signatures. And just after that, we did a we made a list of the campaigns which were the most successful. And of course, the, this instrument wasn't something for the Greens only. It was produced for the European elections, but the intention was to continue it after the elections, and it is continuing now. And we took part in the campaign for carbon for a carbon tax and also uh, the uh, migration, um, the rights of migrants, also the rule of law we campaigned for. But the most successful petitions were collecting signatures about an extremely concrete issue. The best one was bees and everything to do with um, bees dying out and because of the use of pesticides, um, that was the, the strongest, the most successful issue. We also noticed that we had a participation of individual citizens more than or associations, even though TILT is, is, is it's an IT instrument uh, and it came from the Greens. We saw more individuals took it up than organizations. We produced uh, some uh, evaluation of this uh, work, so my, my, my colleagues will be able to tell you more about it. Unfortunately, one of my colleagues who was going to come fell ill yesterday, so she wasn't able to come today. But she's the person who's been following TILT, and she is also very interested in the two ECIs. We also chose... Uh, or we deliberately avoided choosing uh, issues in advance because the campaign wanted to be as broad as possible. We, had, we also wanted the, the possibility of getting some kind of result, a, a, a measurable result in the form of a directive or legislation. That was an important part of being able to determine whether the initiative uh, was successful or not. We also saw that in some EU consultations, you can often see a snowball effect, and that's not always doesn't always work in a virtuous way. I don't know what you think, but I think the whole discussion about winter time, summer time. Uh, this has been manipulated. I don't know what you think. It seems to have been started by the Nordic countries who have different thoughts about it from other countries. And even though there were, f even though five million people uh, took part, and that is a remarkable figure, all of these people, or most of these people, have a, uh, the same vision of, of things. I'm not saying it's necessarily negative. Um, we. We, we, we ourselves have um, <coughs> taken a similar line in our initiatives. But these are things to, to think about, we, um, to see how we can create this uh, snowball effect in a positive way without having to uh, rely on uh, having an awful lot of money or financial resources. So that's, the, that's the difficulty. Uh. Je, je reste sur le français pour, pour répondre à Hervé. Uh, I will answer en fait, Hervé in French. You are raising doubts Hervé about the way we uh, put together an overview of a like, overall de, de uh, reform project uh, in, for the European Citizens Initiative. So how did we do that? I think on the one hand, there's the, the aspect you were raising. We didn't take enough account of national issues, issues which, uh, which capture people's imagination more at national level. 
And the red thread that we used to put together ideas like rule of law, carbon pricing, and reform of democracy in a broader sense was quite, worked in a quite automatic way. In civil society, we've been discussing these things for a long time already. It wasn't a coincidence that during her first speech when she was elected in July, the president-elect of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said, quoted, cited the issue of the rule of law and carbon pricing, which, which um, is absent from the, the Green Deal, but um, yesterday we heard about about aviation tax, it is still an issue. <coughs> so there are, so politicians are aware that these issues are present in civil society, but we don't have the institutional the institutions to, to represent us. The institutions we have at the moment are quite weak, so, as you said, so we need to reform the instruments we have for participatory democracy. But the reason we targeted those issues was to try and respond to what's to issues like um, improving uh, the, the environment, reforming democracy, seems to have a lot of popular support. And I agree that we do have to keep in touch with uh, national organizations which are in touch with public opinion, but then they have to be in touch with each other to make the most of their initiatives transnationally. I don't want to get into a dialogue with you, that wasn't my intention, but it's, it's not a choice of priority uh, in civil society. We, you, you have to make a choice sooner or later. Uh, I very much agree with what you were saying about social justice, uh, making people realize that uh, to get, to get people to support Europe, there has to be some social justice in it. And when people think of Europe, they think of austerity and the market machine and economic pressure on them. Uh, they don't think of social justice. Uh, we've been campaigning for tax justice, uh, and that... I think uh, would be seen as a better European policy, actually, which actually helps people. So, that's how we should approach um, uh, the directives we get from Europe, which don't go as far as we would like them to. We need to, we need to think about fighting harder on those issues. EU MANS uh, has made a number of proposals on uh, carbon pricing, um, and it could have social consequences as well, which, which might even solve several problems at the same time. Uh, so there is a balance to be found between the social and the economic aid uh, side, uh, so you need a fairer distribution of resources. Uh, in a sustainable way, and I think that you'll get a, a better motivation of citizens by pushing those issues. Marco Cappato and then Simona Bonfante. Okay, dico in italiano. On the issue of social rights, I'd just like to point out, even though uh, we, haven't, we weren't in time to work on this, I, I think it is advisable to give support, to give popular support to what is really a very institutional initiative, which is the OCDE. OECD initiative. Sorry, I always get the um, the initials wrong. The OECD is called. 
It published two very important documents against uh, international tax evasion. So that was that it was against tax havens and also against tax evasion as practiced by multinationals. And it was basically asking for two things. First of all, the possibility to tax profits where the service is actually being sold. Uh, this, this is because of tax evasion by companies providing services over the Internet. And the second point was to guarantee a minimum rate of taxation on profits wherever those profits are generated. I don't think this uh, we need to get divided into the usual debate between social democrats and liberals. I think we can all agree that a minimum amount of correctness, a, a de decency in international taxation is necessary. One of the reasons that um, nation states are no longer able to deliver social services and welfare is because their tax revenue is being eroded by this uh, tax evasion. So, that, so without needing to invent anything new, there is something um, where there are already proposals which have come from respected international institutions that I think if we give them, uh, if we support them, that will help to get um, more people behind them and more people aware of them. The other thing I'd like to say is about this magic word, organization. Uh, picking up on what something Michele Minere said, he said that here we're in a, an organization where there are where the European uh, corporations are, res are res represented, and Michele was uh, underlining the importance of individual rights, individual freedoms. Naturally, I agree with uh, the idea of, inter of individual freedoms. Uh, but we should not be naive. Uh, individual freedoms are threatened by uh, scientific progress, so uh, individual freedom also needs to get itself organized, give itself the instruments to promote individual freedoms effectively, otherwise it's just an abstract uh, principle. And this applies both to, uh, to petitions and also to uh, non violence which uh, Renault was talking about. Uh, otherwise people will, will become apathetic and will not, will not um, support um, these popular initiatives because um, they, they think they have nothing to do with them. Uh, if you think about uh, collective organizations like trade unions, they're almost, you know, not, <coughs> nobody takes notice of them anymore. Well, that's exaggerating slightly, but things are moving in that direction. Over the last 20 years, they've lost a lot of members. Trade unions have lost a lot of members. And that hasn't helped individual freedoms, has it? It hasn't fostered free interaction between individuals. Maybe there, haven't, there hasn't been the creation of smaller, more flexible organizations. No. Uh, there's just been, uh, um, because of technology, many middlemen, have, m m intermediary organizations, have been destroyed, have been removed. And this has, been, this has only benefited the liberalist agenda, which is not necessarily good for individual freedoms. But if uh, a person has a serious problem with their, uh, with their sexual identity, with the fact they've been made redundant, whatever individual uh, problem somebody may have had, they would not think now that they can get a, a solution to their problems from politics, from organizations.
da parte di, qualcuno, di qualche organizzatore di manifestazione che dice non voglio le bandiere, non voglio i partiti. Sometimes when people organize uh, demonstrations they say we don't want any political parties, trade unions getting involved, it's just our demonstration. <coughs> But that is uh, not helping, that's um, rendering us powerless. Uh, it's, it's taking away power from these intermediary organizations which represent people, or used to represent people. So if we're venturing down this path of strengthening the instruments of participatory democracy, and if we're going to do it in network with um, other organizations, not just at national level, because at uh, local community level as well, local district level, Uh, organizations have also been damaged uh, by the um, nation state's failure to provide welfare, failure to provide social ne uh, services. So um, the nation state has failed in many respects recently. So we need to have two aspects in mind, individual objectives, social, minimum and common social rights, uh, minimum individual freedoms, respect of the rule of law, respect of the freedom of science and scientific research, making sure uh, technological progress benefits everybody. So those are individual issues we must, uh, of course, bear in mind, but we need to use each of those individual battles to reform the, the instruments of participatory democracy. Now, as far as non-violence is concerned, they have the same problem. Non-violence cannot be taken for granted. Somebody may um, have personal experiences which lead, which lead them to embrace non-violence. Because they, they've been the victim of ex extremist violence or whatever. Uh, but non-violence does not only depend on these personal enlightenments, individual enlightenments. Somebody who uh, is a school leaver in Italy, I think perhaps Italy is not alone in this respect, they will have had millions of hours, I'm not sure exactly how many hours you, you spend at school, but it seemed to be a long time to me, uh, but not one of those many, many hours of lessons are used to teach people how our minds actually work, how we become enslaved by our passions or by our own anger. There's, there's no education in, in self-awareness, there's no edu education in em emotional intelligence so we understand our own emotions, so we can understand other people's emotions. These th things need to be taught. There's We are we spending hundreds of billions of euros in Europe on parliaments, electoral campaigns, elections, printing the ballot papers, We're spending so much money on that, on, on the nuts and bolts of, of, of democracy, but we don't actually spend any money on um, educating uh, voters to, to, to vote intelligently. And that's, that's completely, um, it's, it's an obvious imbalance, and then people wonder why democracy isn't working properly. At the same time, we have an educational system where 99.99% of the time is used to educate people in Uh, give people factual knowledge uh, and that doesn't take account of the fact that of technological progress that you no longer need to absorb large amounts of uh, factual uh, knowledge. 
So we need a revolution, a gradual res- revolution in the, in the best sense of that term, in democracy. Uh, and that, but that has to go hand in hand with educational reform. And I think there's a link between the two aspects because uh, exercising democratic rights is also part of our education. In Italy, people know what a referendum is uh, because we've had them about divorce, abortion, uh, the judiciary, uh, nuclear power. We've had a whole, uh, a whole series of referenda. Uh, but in 10 years' time, nobody will know anymore in Italy what a referendum is unless, it can be, unless we can revitalize the culture of participatory democracy. So following a political issue like carbon pricing, the rule of law, artificial intelligence, uh, is, is essential. You need to have followed those issues to, to uh, vote intelligently. Otherwise, we'll have public squares full of people who are, don't really know what they want. And they're being manipulated by extremely powerful men, even women in some cases, uh, who um, have nobody behind them. Democraticamente, cioè quindi con un buon consenso, delle soluzioni ai problemi concreti della nostra vita. We need people who will tackle the real problems which are behind our lives and not just put up a front. Uh, Simona Bonfante, Carlo Maresca e Monica Frasso. I was actually just noting that this pen is branded with the European election 23-26 May, so part of the 36 millions went to this pen. Well, a um, few, few weeks ago, the Italian Parliament approved a constitutional reform which cut the number of MPs of the AF. Um, this decision was taken by basically all the parties um, with the support of the civic society of which you, Lorenzo, were speaking before. So I don't really understand what kind of idea you have of the civic society. Probably those 30 people sitting in a room agreeing on everything or, I don't know, the 300 people we may represent outside, but civic society is also behind that decision which is killing democracy. So what should we do, we supporter of uh, direct democracy, do to um, preserve this definite, definite this destruction of representative democracy which still is needed? Another point, rule of law. It's not, I think, due to the pressure of civic society that uh, Ursula von, von der Leyen put it at the top of his agenda, because actually the European Commission didn't, aff- didn't afford the issue when it, ca- it, it had to do with Malta, still. Uh, Daphne Caruana Galicia was killed three years ago, I think now, or even more, two, right. So no, no, no discussion there was about Malta at the time. It was okay due to the open <laughs> breaching of the treaties by basically two member states. But as we know, it's not just Hungary, it's not just Poland who daily do breach the fundamental rights or the, the principle itself of democracy. And here again, I don't see like a huge movement of people, not in Hungary, not in Poland, because they had elections and they vote again for the ruling parties, establishing just another idea of democracy. So I think we have to, to be, you know, honest with ourselves. And um, I, I, I do, I do, do we say um, overestimate the role we can play? 
that's it. Interverrò in italiano e mi scuso. I'll take the floor in Italian. Volevo ehm, cercare di fare una riflessione I wanted to try anche un po' una domanda che cerca di connettere sort of a comment, sort of a question at the same time. I want to try to link together these topics of information partecipativa della policy sul participatory democracy and with the carbon pricing policy delle iniziative and also dei cittadini europei with the European Citizens Initiative. We can all agree that the weakest point of the European Citizens Initiative is the fact that it doesn't get much space for debate in the public sphere, because its only objective, really, if you collect the signatures, so, uh, 10,000 citizens, well, all it will do, all the ECI will do is uh, focus some citizens' attention, a certain number of citizens' attention, on this debate and put them at the heart of the public debate and force the Commission and Parliament to take notice of it. The fact is, though, that it's not well known and the ECI is enshrined in the treaties, but not everybody knows about it. This is partly a lack of, due to a lack of information, but also a lack of awareness raising on the instrument. And because of that, I don't think you'd have even 20% of the population that know about this. Even though it is a right that they have, a right, this has led me to think about Monica Frassoni's comment when she was talking about a respect relationship between the European Green Party and citizens' movements, civic movements, including the future movement, because that's a civic movement in itself. But why can't we, civil movements and parties, reason together about a common tool and a common instrument which would help us to achieve our goals and also help us to collaborate on projects together? I have been able to have discussions with several people, I'm not sure if I can call them stakeholders, but at least people who are involved in Farmers for Future at national and European level and so on. And their problem is that they are a very horizontal organization. There is no hierarchy at all. So it's very difficult to know who to get into contact with. But nonetheless, we do have the same aims. We want to try to find and develop tools which will help us to combat climate change. And both civil society and us, as political representatives, have the same aim. We're trying to establish a European citizens' movement. We both want to use the ECI. None of us think that we'll collect one million signatures if things stay as they are. And ECI has been put forward, which has around 25,000 signatures so far. But why can't we promote this more? Why can't we get carbon adjustment to the forefront of the European agenda via means of an ECI? I think it should be possible to do this. Well, maybe it's not quite uh, true to say that i di queste, um, we have exactly the same aims, but all ECI promoters are focusing on science and scientific analysis to draw up political proposals. Carbon pricing is a very cross-cutting policy. Uh, for the scientific world. I can't say that everyone agrees on it, but it's true that it's very cross-cutting 
There are very few economists or climate scientists, environmental scientists, international experts or environmental engineers that will say that carbon pricing is not important. No, in fact, they say quite the opposite. Opposite, they say that carbon pricing is a very efficient tool to cut emissions to the necessary rate. So, my question is something I'm wondering about myself, but I'm also thinking and uh, putting this to Marco and Monica and others. It's as follows. Why don't we try? to approach the scientific world, to rebuild a sort of a European citizens' initiative, or at least put pressure on the ones that are currently there, promote the ones that already exist, by means of the organizations that uh, haven't provided us with any other tools to, to promote them. Perché non si pensa di ritirare tutte le iniziative cittadini europei che and hanno come obiettivo la lotta ai cambiamenti climatici utilizzando lo strumento di carbon pricing che ne sono quattro. There were four of them. Ne sono quattro. There were four of them, e con not just one. Con delle motivazioni diciamo, politiche di carenza e di assenza di diritto. Perché la non conoscenza di carbon pricing è il nome stesso di questo strumento di carbon pricing. Perché la non conoscenza è il nome stesso di questo strumento di carbon pricing. Perché la non conoscenza è il nome stesso di questo strumento di carbon pricing. Perché la non conoscenza è il nome stesso di questo strumento di carbon pricing. Perché la non conoscenza è il nome stesso di questo strumento di carbon pricing. Perché la non conoscenza è il nome stesso di questo strumento di carbon pricing. Perché la non conoscenza è il nome stesso and the right to vote for the ECI is a violation of the rule of law. It's very unfortunate that this is not well known and not being able to use it is a violation of a human right, in my opinion. Grazie Carlo. Abbiamo Monica Frassoni. Thanks Carlo. Monica Frassoni, then I will speak, and then Professor Haumann. Grazie. Io vorrei eh, intervenire rapidamente su uh, I wanted to quickly come in on two or three topics sulla riflessione and che then continue on from allora, what you said il primo previously. Punto è quello First of all, Io sono veramente on organizations, con, eh, I've always Marco, had a lot of time for Marco, uh, I've always agreed with him that without a proper organization you won't get anywhere either in politics or in civil society. And I think that one of the problems that all these new movements have, including the Five Star Movement back a few years ago, is that they underestimated the need to organize, because organize is, organization is a way of exercising your democratic rights. Sul tema dell'organizzazione so è anche un modo well attraverso il quale noi um, um, in realtà non siamo forse cioè noi, non, non si è forse non si riesce ad essere and perhaps that's propri, why we and others haven't been able to achieve our goals. For example, Marco, I don't know if you remember, but when we were both at the Parliament, at some point Grillo was in the Parliament, and uh, Chiesa as well, and there was a meeting with all of the MEPs because they wanted to hear from him about some of the topics he was uh, pushing forward environmental, but also things to do with corruption, a whole range of different matters. And when we had this meeting with him, we realized that his intention was not really to build an alliance with us within the parliament or any kind of democratic alliance in order to achieve certain goals that we both that we all agreed on. But what he actually wanted to do was disrupt the order, dismantle the current order. Order. And throw out all politicians. Marco, I'm not sure if you remember, but I remember being struck by the concept that not all politicians are equal. And when you set aside and ignore all politicians, what you actually do is strengthen people who are already in a stronger position because they have, they have more money, they have other interests, and you weaken those who should, in fact, be in a position to help you. Earlier we were talking about the relationship with politics, and the crucial topic which Marco raised a few years ago is that you need to be able to draw a distinction. You need to, to, to realize that not all politicians are the same. 
And this is very important for civil society if we want to have an impact on the institutions. We need to use our vote to reward those who are acting in the right way. So I think that one of the biggest victories of the alternative system and the anti-democratic system has really been that they uh, have broken this relationship between democracy and civil society in their pursuit of certain specific goals. The link between organization and achieving specific goals, as you were saying as well, is a strong one. These two things are definitely linked to one another, but they often come against the problem I just referred to. Not all of us are on the TV every day, but ma che però anche lì adesso si stanno dibattendo per capire che cosa fare con tutta questa grande mobilitazione peraltro anche lì molto Many people eh, non direi manipolata ma molto a bigger platform than we do and are able to promote their interests in uh, more targeted way and it's perhaps only right that they do so we can see the uh, impact that Salvini's angry speeches have had uh, sometimes positive, sometimes not. But we don't know whether or not this will really help us further our aims on the four or five topics that are really dear to our hearts. Oggi le sardine sono quotate a circa il 22%, quindi ci sarà il 22% di elettori italiani che voterebbero questi. Apparently 22.2% of Italians today are polled as saying that they would vote for the sardini, so we have to watch out for that. Well, yes, but then you have polls that say that 19% of Italians would vote for the Green Party if they had the chance, so you can't always trust these polls. Anyway, sure, but uh, what I want to come back to is that this aspect of having a good, a good organization, having clear defined objectives uh, is crucial. At the same time, you also need to be able to identify methods for fighting, for using a positive angle to really question the people who are the decision makers and make them think about what they're signing at the end of the day. You suggested, I think, uh, looking at these four ECIs and treating them as a group, getting together with all of the promoters and trying to see how we could perhaps uh, work together. I don't see any problem with doing that, personally. When it comes to the ECI on carbon tax, my difficulty, my struggle is that I don't know how to enter the debate that already exists at institutional level in a way that will help us to have enough of an impact and achieve enough results. I know that this is being discussed at European level and it's not always uh, subject to a unanimous agreement. But it is cited as being one of the important aspects of the Green New Deal, which is something that's been mentioned, but it hasn't yet been um, fully fleshed out. So we need to understand what the stage of the debate is in the institutions, what kinds of alliances we might be able to create, uh, uh, not just for collecting signatures, but uh, we know that the Commission also wants to come up with a proposal on that. Microphone's gone, sorry. But also linking our actions and the ECIs to what's happening already at European level could be an additional tool that we could allow ourselves to uh, use. Uh, thank you. Microphone's gone. Shit. And they listen a voice. <laughs> Okay, I will speak, and then we have Professor Amman and Professor Renou, uh, Sibyl.
Sibilla. Okay, cool. Um, so the point where I disagree with Monica, or maybe we use two different terms to, to say the same thing, is that I think politics is one, and then there are multiple ways. I mean, this is how I see it and how I see what we are doing. So there is politics, and then there are different ways to achieve political results, one of which is being elected within the institutions, and uh, that's essential. But then I think there is an element of reappropriation of the possibility to have a political impact uh, and being proud of doing politics uh, and saying and claim that you are doing political activities without being within the framework of political parties. And I think the problem, so there is a problem and also there is an opportunity. One problem is that uh, um, for these movements that we were quote, referring to, like the Sardinis and, uh, and all the others, is that uh, the scale is not the parties. I would understand if, the, if there was an issue with parties. Wouldn't agree, but understand. I have a problem when the problem is with politics. When I go, oh, and the same problem, I have the same problem also with some civil society organizations. Uh, I make an example. We presented the rule of law European citizen initiative to um, the guys at Transparency International. And they were concerned to support the European citizen initiative because it aims for a political impact. So when civil society organizations get scared of having a political impact, then we got a big problem. Um, so I think what a platform like humans can do is to offer two parties, two movements, two organizations um, a set of solutions and ideas and proposals which act more on the concept of public sphere than civil society, and I think this is an important element. So the public sphere is those elements where we move and agree on the values, on the democratic debate, on the change within certain frameworks. And I think uh, this is something to keep in mind in our elaboration into this. Um, to go back to what Hervé was saying about the amount of potential campaigns and action that can be done uh, on the necessity to choose one, um, so I think I, I see two elements. If I have to choose one, the most important to me is that people are aware of the fact that they need to be aware that they can do stuff. Uh, but on the other side, I think if we want to try to imagine a reform on different topics, we should be able to um, unleash those people within the public sphere that feel the urgency of a specific instance. And then you will have... Uh, sort of hubs of uh, people that care only about carbon pricing, like Carlo, Great, Carlo Greto Maresca, <laughs> or people that care only about reforming democracies, like Lorenzo Churchill Vineo. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I think uh, the, 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 the challenge that we have imagining what we are building is how we have uh, people and organizations that cooperate together on urgencies, that if you put them together, you get a sort of a reform type of approach. And um, because I think each person that is engaged in politics uh, or each organization that set up itself to have a mission feels a certain urgency. Uh, but on the other side, each person and each organization who is smart enough is aware that needs to cooperate with others beyond borders, beyond time and space. So my last... Um, reasoning is that I think in the moment when you want to cooperate uh, you need to balance two things and we go to the organization bit you need to balance your identity as a person or as an organization so you have your mission your idea your thing but also you give a bit away of that because you need to cooperate with, with others and the other treasure is the time so if I'm super active in my campaign, I have a limited amount, of, or, or within my organization, I have a limited amount of time, because time is not infinite. I don't know, Professor, what thinks about it, but I would say it's not infinite. <laughs> so you need to find the organizational approach that allows each individual and each organization to be super effective in its own urgency, but also to give enough space for a platform to work 
where, I don't know, you have regular meetings, I mean, you define the processes, but then you have regular meetings, regular tools that doesn't take too much away from your own urgency. So it's a bit of a philosophical trip, but I swear it was making sense in my, my brain. <laughs> Uh, Professor Klaus Amann. Actually, I am impressed by all these new thoughts for me and this experience you have already at uh, a, a young age for me. <laughs> uh, I have to tell you an experience which is uh, nearly unique in Bulgaria. I was present at the democratic revolution in the forefront. I marched with the two last demonstrations and we were still really afraid of being shot at that time, you know. But after the second big demonstration, we were in the restaurant Budapest and Mladenov announced his retirement in a black and white screen. And you should have heard this huronic cry of the whole restaurant. What happened? And we ran out to the street and danced with everybody. It was a euphoria I will never, ever again go through. And I thought all the problems in Bulgaria are now solved, you know big breakthrough and so on. And then I was in, even invited to, to come to other meetings and one I met. Uh, but I saw, in the hindsight, I must say, there was so much amateurish action afterwards. Still in the euphoria, we have solved the problems. And actually, no problems were solved. And it just dissipated the whole thing. And the big revolutionaries like Boyanov and other zoology guys and academic guys, they just vanished from the scene. They didn't show up anymore. And the governments were really bad governments. And, and now we have the, the bodyguard of Shivkov ruling for 10 years. Huh? in Bulgaria. What a shame, huh? But how to solve? And now I come to this group and see, well, it would have been so good to have you around 30 years ago. <laughs> That's my compliment to you. Thank you. Merci. Je, je vais parler en français. Thank you. Pas trop vite. I'll take the floor in French. I'll try not to go too fast. Je n'ai pas participé à votre journée hier, donc je veux pas. I didn't take part poser, in your meeting yesterday. Rappeler peut-être un ou poser une question sur l'action directe. So I don't have all the information, le, but I just wanted to ask a question about direct action with regard to participatory democracy and the importance of movements that have been uh, springing up all around Europe. Les, uh, in the domain of civil disobedience, and Marco Capato is a very good example of that. He carried out civil disobedience that led to a change in legislation. But these movements are very important, especially in the environmental domain and others as well. And this is a topic that really catches the attention of young people. In many of our countries, there are civil disobedience encourages people who are training others to carry out civil disobedience and they're very successful. So I think in participatory dem democracy, uh, it's not just about petitions, although they are important, but also moving on to direct action to civil disobedience. This will help open other doors. It will raise more awareness among young people. And, and I'm not necessarily talking about mass process, protests because a lot of people have have to become aware of this first, but it means that there is more attention in the public sphere for certain topics such as carbon tax and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, you touch upon an important element of the humans.
project, which is the idea that uh, the Europe, maybe we didn't say this enough during the past couple of days, um, the European Citizen Initiative was chosen as a, the uh, main tool of action, uh, first of all, because it's the only participatory democracy tool available within the European Union. Secondly, because it allows us to have uh, a conversation with other people based on an actual democratic tool and not just a statement or an approach to an issue. But on the other side, we never thought, and I think we should discuss it this more further, uh, and was the purpose of this, the previous panel, uh, it's not the only tool. Uh, so the, the change doesn't happen in the vacuum of a collection of signatures. And I think the point that Monica raised on finding the political angle for the carbon pricing is also, for example, an element of our uh, approach. Uh, we have Sibylla, then we don't have anyone else registered to speak. Nic Nicolas? Uh, just one thing in terms of timing. At four, it will start the Good Lobby Awards. So I would say we, at quarter to, to four, we, we close. So we have some time to go and move. Uh, okay, uh, Sibylla and Nicolò. Um, a proposito della battaglia sul carbon tax e sul fatto che raccogliere le firme dei cittadini and, uh, possa essere meno, diciamo, uh, importante da legare invece delle iniziative in Parlamento, uh, io penso che eh, questo strumento in the Parliament. Parliament. Uh, I think this instrument needs victories. That will help to convince citizens and help uh, stir up some political passion and make them feel that their action actually means something and makes a difference. Uh, we, it's important for us to have some success stories or some victories, you know, which we can point back to, like on pesticides, but we don't have a lot of them. Uh, and all of these issues are important in their own Right. But if we can get one success story, that will establish a channel and then we can strengthen that, uh, that channel. So it's very important to build a channel. We don't yet have one. It's extremely, or we do, but it's extremely fragile. We need to uh, construct the pro a process that will lead to success, but we're just in the foothills of that. Uh, we should give it priority. If, because if institutions become receptive to this kind of initiative, uh, then that would transform the, the whole thing. That's all I wanted to say, I think. Uh, Nicola? Yeah, I, I wanted to remind us that the, the European Commission these days is talking about the Convention on the Future of Europe and the European Council, and, and, and there's plenty of people now talking about civic deliberation and civic assemblies, from the European Commission to the Council, to Fridays for Future that wants to run their own civic assemblies on the climate, to Extinction Rebellion who will do their own contesting uh, what Fridays for Future are doing, and so on. And I wonder whether there's not a way for us to um, align in a virtuous way these different moments of civic deliberation so that we have, almost as a Civic Disobedience Act, the Extinction Rebellion civic deliberation about what Europe ought to be doing on climate at the same time outside the official Convention on the Future of Europe uh, deliberation so that we're we're not trying to force everybody into one space, but we're saying there's a multiplicity of spaces which are contesting and dialoguing uh, between themselves. So I really feel like this civic deliberation question is, uh, is one that many people are picking up on assemblies and so on. And, and in that regard, I also think that there's some, um, there's some need for utopian proposals um, in a time when also the, the, the European machinery is a little bit trying to capture the, the spirit of civic deliberation and, and, and use it for its own ends. And so one proposal I would make, which is not, by no means unique, is, for example, give Strasbourg to the citizens. What should we do with the Strasbourg Parliament? Um, well, give it to the citizens. It should be a permanent space of uh, civic assemblies, civic panels and so on. If France comes back and says, but it's a historic place of European reconciliation, we say, yes, exactly, it's where the citizens should meet <laughs> to, uh, to deliberate together. And so why not have that as a, as a kind of proposal just to symbolize the need for institutional space run by the citizens for the citizens? Which would solve the problem of the funding to political initiative as well, <laughs> like more space for action. 
um, Maria Luisa uh, Stasi, and uh, then maybe Carlo Maresca in between. You can add your name to the list. Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, um, a quick reaction to uh, a couple of things that have been said. Um, um, as, as it was rightly said, not all politics are the same. I would tend to believe that not all civil society is the same as well. Uh, I know I see the big picture, I know what, where this comes from, but there are a number of civil society organisations that are not afraid at all to be engaged in what can be defined as a political debate, all the contrary. And this goes at national level, but also at international level and European level. I think, for example, about a number of civil society organisations have strongly pushed for, against the copyright uh, uh, new rules, and they've been attacked by a uh, member of the parliament. They've been uh, attacked because, in theory, they were pushing the same position as Google, but in practice, what we were trying to do was to defend free expression. So we do that uh, uh, with parliaments, we do that with uh, parties. Uh, so if there is a common goal, not necessarily all civil society behaves the same towards politics. We actually believe in many places where we act that we need more politicians and more, more uh, parties to be involved in the fight because it's the only way. Um, concerning um, a very, very quick reaction on the Sardine movement, and uh, uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, a possible interpretation. Uh, I do believe, uh, I agree that uh, it's difficult to go uh, further if you don't have uh, a representation and if you don't have a message. But I also uh, have to say that I'm not surprised at all because this is the way uh, things uh, generally go. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that I see a... Uh, um, lowering down of the political debate, uh, especially in Italy, because this is what I follow the closest. In, well, I, in UK, it tends to be some, sometimes uh, similar, but anyhow. Um, so the, the point is that um, the uh, political discourse has been moved somehow over uh, social media platforms that does, don't allow for sophisticated uh, confrontation. They allow mostly their perfect platform for very superficial uh, slogan, no debate, uh, no, no ideas, and especially no responsibility for what you say or do or try to push for. So this total de-responsabilization goes hands to hands with what Marco was saying before, that we need education, we need, uh, we need people to know, we need people to be uh, aware, we need people to be instructed about how to use their own rights. Um, the fact that uh, uh, you show up in, in a square and you kind of uh, uh, put together reaction from people that are tired, they're unhappy and everything, but you don't say anything and you don't have a leader, that means you're not going to take any responsibility for, for whatever happens. So you live in the present. There is no future, there is no strategy, there is no long-term goal, and this is useless. I mean, it's good as a signal, but then after that it's useless. What I'm trying to say is that this is not... I see the two things. So putting all the political debate in this way on social media and on, on, on this de completely de-responsabilized, or however we want to say that in English, environment, uh, being very much in line with filling a square and not having any representation, not having any program, and refusing to have it. Uh, so maybe if we want to intervene on one, we need to intervene on the other as well. There is no one signed to talk, so it's free moment. Capato, I was sure. And then Franco dopo, after Marco. No, allora dopo Franco, perché volevo andare un po' verso le conclusioni. After Franco, because I'd like to move towards some conclusions. Where is Franco? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make a quick remark. I think uh, um, talking about the sardines and the Friday for Futures uh, kids and everything, I think there is a hunger for representation. There is a lack of, uh, I think people feel like they have lost representation from, uh, from big, uh, big parties. And, uh, and what, they're, what they're asking to do is, okay, we don't really want to be that much involved with policy, but we want people to actually interpret the needs that we, uh, the, that we have at this point. Um, so I think uh, uh, we should be careful with uh, trying to uh, try, uh, trying to ask. We should be careful with asking them to try to um, elaborate too much on policy. Not because it's not right to, to uh, for for citizens to elaborate on policies, but because they are. Um, uh, they're, what they're trying to do is, okay, we, have, we are showing you where the, the gap is in the policy debate at this point, and we need somebody to interpret it. 
um, we had we were having a conversation with some colleagues, some other environmental colleagues, uh, environmental science uh, colleagues about this. They were saying, okay, well, but the, the Fridays for Future uh, movement, yeah, they're saying, yeah, we want all these, uh, uh, we want uh, environmental policies to be taken seriously, but you know, prices might go up, and they're not really argu uh, arguing properly uh, against, uh, not against, but in an art articulated way for uh, for environmental policy. And if there are some repercussions in policy, then uh, uh, people will get angry. Making, for for instance, the example of the of um, of the yellow jackets in uh, in France, but that is really not the point of this uh, of these movements at this point. And there is there needs to be something else that uh, that fills up uh, this uh, this gap of representation. And that's what really they're they're asking at this point. So that's uh, that's everything. Valice and then Michael. Volevo leggervi una cosa che spiega abbastanza bene like to read something which explains the problem of communication policy. It's called uh, un tempo si the dance of the rain. Della There was a time when we did a rain dance. Ululava, ballava, people used to dance rain. around uh, to make it rain. Pioveva, no. and it rain sometimes it rained and sometimes it didn't, esatto. but it didn't really depend on, on, on the dance. Talvolta pioveva, talvolta so sometimes no. it rained and sometimes it didn't. Da lui, uh, it, credo. It, it, I don't think it depended on the, on the exorcisms uh, or the rights that they carried out. Today, uh, we have politics uh, doing the same irrelevant thing as the rain dance, trying to prevent the glaciers melting and world temperatures increasing. Uh, and to relaunch economic growth and to get uh, overcome stagnation. Uh, but things haven't always been like this. Uh, for, a, for a few centuries, it was possible to take collective decisions in a democratic way, in a harmonious way. And the decisions did actually mean some, something, not a lot maybe, but they meant something in the sphere of our common existence. But that is no longer the case. I'm sorry sorry to have to say this, but uh, politics isn't even scratching the surface of events. It is impossible for pol politics to keep up because of the infinite speed of communication flows. It has become impossible to influence the course of events because the complexity uh, of economic, social and psychic relations has become such that uh, no single force can dominate them. And there are automatisms in uh, linguistic uh, communication which it is impossible to control. I would have liked to conclude more optimistically. No, io penso che dei margini per la decisione politica molto grandi ci siano ancora. Uh, I don't think there are any great margins of maneuver for, for political decisions. Uh, we want to move towards renewable energy. That is, uh, seems a simple uh, principle. It's a very political principle, and there are massive economic interests at stake. So it's a, it's a political decision in the, in the classic sense of the word. Uh, but it's impossible to keep up the, with the details of technological change and pr produce ever more minute legislation to keep up with changes. Uh, that, 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 is a, that kind of approach is doomed to failure. It simply can't keep up. I would, so I'd like to conclude on a few more promising ways forward. And then we can go our various ways, uh, knowing what we have to do. I think um, Nicolò's uh, reference to the conference on the Convention on the Future of Europe is very important. I think we need to, to follow that very carefully. Also, the idea about Strasbourg is not a bad idea. 20 years ago, we, we did to do a whole campaign about the cost of the parliament having two bases. 
una sorta di seconda camera but we could create a kind of second chamber for participatory democracy that is it seems to be not a bad idea at all But I think we need to continue with our proposal that we should that the Commission should give parity of esteem to representative democracy and participatory democracy. I don't think it would work, Sibila, if we say, let's open a table, or everybody come and join us, because uh, immediately somebody would say, well, who is convening this round table? What right do they have to convene it? And uh, who are you going to, which NGOs are you going to invite? No, penso che qualcosa di simile di quello But I think something along the lines you're suggesting could be, could be done on the basis of, of objectives and proposals. I think we can agree that more information must be given about uh, ECIs. The best way to collect signatures for ECIs is to give money to private organizations who have millions of email addresses at their disposal. So that, that at the moment is the best, seems to be the best way of collecting signatures. We have sent a letter to the European Commissioner. We need to see whether, wait to see whether anyone else will sign it, and then maybe we could turn it into a petition, and then perhaps into a, a draft amendment to the EU's budget. Then we would put it to the Commission, and if the Commission did not adopt it, we would take it to the parliamentary groups. At the same time, I think we could start putting together this uh, platform, this package of European reform proposals, which would not be an exhaustive list of all possible reforms, but it would enable us to get away from these, uh, this plethora of individual initiatives climate change, um, cannabis, etc. It would help us to, to have a more, um, have a better overview. Uh, I think we might, it might help also if we have some uh, remote uh, conferences uh, to create something like a, a, a participatory democracy council. That is something that could perhaps be hosted by the European Economic and Social Committee uh, on an agreed basis, agreed timetable. That, and that would give some continuity to the work we have started. And this gives me an opportunity to thank the interpreters once again. Thank you, Chairman. We uh, tried to uh, surprise them. We went. Uh, we had an extra short lunch break. We came back when they weren't here. We changed the schedule in mid-flight. Most of this is spontaneous uh, debate, so I, I know that makes the work um, more difficult because it's not based on written documents. So I'm very grateful for your contribution. I think we, so I think we've gone, we've made a start. Um, we've still got a long way to go. Uh, it appears that Gilles' mother is Bruxelles tired of having him at home in Milan all the time, so she has, she'll send him to Brussels and 
So, um, we, we rapporti, quelle relazioni anche con il mondo he will europeo be able e belga to keep in touch with, the, in with Ottavia and with the, Quindi, the, the European movement in Belgium. A instillare in questa ultima fase di riunione e dando la parola so I hope that we can conclude on a, an optimistic note and so I give the floor to Virginia Fiume for the last word but I think there is we can keep that glimmer of hope in our hearts when we leave today No, allora, um, direi che è stato... No, sorry, I want to speak in English, sorry. Uh, so, thanks, Mark, and cheers to my mom. Um, no, um, I think it was very important to have an opportunity to be here all together, and I really want to thank to thank all the discussants, uh, uh, the European Citizen Initiatives promoter who joined us today, starting from that letter, uh, like Veneta, and uh, the, the ECI about the aviation tax and the European Citizen Initiative about the um, genome editing, because I think it's important, as we were saying, to go beyond the borders of each initiative, first of all, even beyond geographical borders. I want to thank the um, organizations that made this possible, starting from uh, um, Science for Democracy, Associazione Luca Coscioni, but also the sort of almost blind support by European alternatives, the Good Lobby, ECIT Foundation, and the Centro d'Azion Laïque, blind in the sense that, uh, as, as we all have seen, it's a process. So uh, it's great that we had the opportunity to, to create a space for, um, for dialogue and confrontation on these topics. Um, you will hear from us again. Uh, I just want to thank, take one more minute to thank uh, Annalisa Angeli, who helped us to find this location, uh, Simona Bonfante and Roberto Mancuso, who worked there very hard to make sure that we had a humans.eu website ready as a V0 for, for this opportunity. And uh, all the, and I don't want to forget anyone, so all the guys that are working on this in Italy since months on uh, setting up the initiatives and uh, making this debate more meaningful because it's based on facts on the ground and initiatives and not only ideas and statements. And um, I think that's it. Uh, see you soon. And thanks for the people who follow us on social media channels and Michael Bra for making it happen as well. Scusate, scusate, per raggiungere il Van Merlin to get to Van Merlin, uh, we don't have to go outside, there is a footbridge, you have to go down to the fourth floor. Uh, to get the footbridge or the pass around across to the Van Marlen building. So don't throw your badge away. There'll be somebody waiting for us on the fourth floor. Otherwise, we, we won't get out of the building. <laughs>